last session. For our last talk of our workshop, I have the honor to introduce my former postdoctoral advisor, uh, Luc Vinet, who is uh, a professor at l'Université de Montréal in physics, and also the CEO of IVADO, which is a new Quebec-wide collaborative institute in the field of digital intelligence and some other things. And he will tell us about the entanglement of fermions on Hamming and Johnson graphs. Please take it away, Luke. All right, thank you very much, Crystal. Pleasure to, to be with us. I'd like to thank my fellow organizers for doing all the work. Um, so how about some, some physics? I could have entitled uh, this, uh, uh, this talk, uh, could have been Terwilliger algebras and entanglement, but uh, let, let's, let's go with this. Uh, it it's work that has been done with a really brilliant student, Pierre-Antoine Bernard, and um, my fellow uh, and friend, Nicolas Crampé in, in France. We've done work with Crystal actually on entanglement of fermions on graph, but this one will be, this talk will be uh, mostly about uh, the Hamming and Johnson graphs and, so, and will be about the two papers that you can see there. Uh, I realize that some of you are not so familiar with physics. Entanglement is about correlations between parts of physical systems when you put the total system in a certain state. It's very relevant to quantum information, quantum many body physics. It, there's enormous activity, you know, uh, aiming at quantifying entanglement. And it's very useful to look at it in, in models where you can push the uh, analytical uh, features. And such is the case with fermions. But I'll, I'll try to give a, some background so that you, you don't get bogged down too much in, in the notation or in the words that I'm saying. So first, some, something about entanglement. As I said, it's a notab notable feature of quantum mechanics, and it's you know it's a key it's key in teleportation, for instance. And the simplest context to talk about this is to imagine that you have a state in quantum mechanics. Physical systems are described by states, and that state is in a Hilbert space is, is a, a Hilbert space that is the product of two Hilbert spaces, describing two parts A and B. And uh, you, you will say that the system is entangled if the state cannot be, the state vector cannot be written as a product. In which case, if this was so, it would mean that you can bring together without interaction those two parts. There would be no correlation. And when you cannot write this, the vector uh, as a product, well, then you say that the state is entangled and a typical example that is served is this one where clearly you can see that you cannot write this psi minus, this Bell state as a product of two states. Now, Chris also, you know, introduced density matrices. Uh, this is a way of descri describing quantum states, but it allows you to describe states that you don't know perfectly. And so this is why it introduces some probabilities here. There's sum is equal to one. And uh, it means that you don't know the system perfectly. Now, of course, if all these probabilities except one are zero, then you know your state perfectly. And then you have a pure state. And this uh, density matrix will just get written like this. It's totally equivalent as just giving the vector. Uh, but we, we will use that notation. Why? Because we also need to talk about reduced density matrix. This is a way of obtaining the density matrix for a part of the system from the density matrix of the total system. And the procedure is very simple. You just trace out the part that concerns the system that you're not interested in. So if we have our state, our pure state here, CAB, and its density matrix, well, the reduced density matrix would be the trace over the Hilbert space HB of this row AB. And you, I think you'll imagine at least that this reduced density matrix tells you all you can know quantum mechanically about the part A of the system. 
And just to see examples, you see, if we add this product state, which is manifestly not entangled, the density matrix you, of this pure state is just of this form. If you trace over B, uh, well, you'll just be left with this density matrix or in matrix form, it will be this. And you obviously see that this is a pure state. That is A, the system, the subsystem A is in a pure state as should be because it was so from the beginning. But if you rather have an entangled state, like the example I had here, you form the density matrix out of this pure state, uh, but then you trace over B, it's a simple exercise to see that you will get for the reduced density matrix, this with, which you see is a complete mixture. It's this state with probability one half and this one with probability one half. It's a full mixture. So this is what you have when the, so you really don't know at all the state or that, that's all the knowledge you have on this, the part, the state of the part A. And when you want to quantify entropy, you use, uh, sorry, when you want to quantify entanglement, you use entropies. There are various definitions. The simplest one is the von Neumann entropy, which is just defined as the, the negative of the trace rho ln rho. And you see in the case of our uh, pure system, uh, well, this uh, trace of rho on rho will be equal to zero. While in this case, you will see that it will be equal to log two. So zero, no entropy, not entangled. Uh, and uh, this will be maximal entanglement. All right, so I hope this gives you, if you did not know what it was, a little idea of what we're talking about. We're measuring correlations of a subsystem within, with, between a subpart and the complement in a total system. I will want to discuss the, this, this entanglement situation with fermions because again, they are amenable to nice treatment. Fermions are the particles that obey the Pauli principle. Namely, you all have learned that. So you cannot put two such particles in the same state. And how do, do we describe that? Well, we impose that the, the state vector for the total system is anti-symmetric under the exchange of these fermions. And if two were at the same place, the state would vanish by this anti-symmetry property. And we construct or we ensure that this is so by using creation and annihilation operator. So they, you know, you build the presence of these fermions by acting on a vacuum state. This vacuum state has the property that it is annihilated by the annihilation operator. And, the, and then acting on this vacuum, you create state with a number of such fermions by acting on that state with these creation operators. And these ends here can be zero or one because you cannot have, you know, the, these operators are nilpotent because you cannot have more than one fermion in the state. And this whole business is embodied in the algebra, which is here that is obeyed by these creation and annihilation operators, which is very, very standard. You know that, the, the, as I said, they are nilpotent and constructed like this, these states form the basis for uh, this vector space. Okay, so these are the tools I will use. I hope it, you, what I said give you a certain amount of comfort. The general goal is to pick a graph with F, the set of vertices, to put fermions on the vertices of these graph of this graph, then we'll provide some dynamics for the evolution of these fermions on the graph. It will be given by the adjacency matrix. We'll take the system in the ground state. I'll come back to that, but uh, I'll come back to that. This will be the state we put the, the full system in. Then we'll split it in two parts and we'll look for the interaction of one part with the other or its correlation. The outline, I will tell you, give you some details of how we describe these fermions on graph. Then thankfully you all know that, but I will need tools from association schemes. I'll, I'll be very brief. 
don't want to bore you with, but I'll just to set up notation, I'll review some. And then for the main part of my talk, I'll discuss the, the simplest situation of these fermions on hypercubes. And uh, interestingly, I will need to make an analogy with signal processing to introduce uh, operators that will need to perform the computation. These will be generalized Hoyne operator, and I'll show you how we use them. And then I'll indicate to you how we could repeat the analysis with respect for Johnson graph. And it will allow me to, I hope I'll have time to, to discuss a little bit the, the, uh, the relation between the Terwilliger algebra of the Johnson graph and the Hahn algebra. So that, that's the program I want to achieve. So how do we describe free fermions on graphs? Well, I have, I'll denote my vertices by V and to, you know, I want to be able to create such fermions on each of the vertices. So I will have the, these uh, creation or annihilation operators labeled by the, ver the vertex uh, label. Uh, and uh, I will take A to be the adjacency matrix of the graph. These these are kets. This is a standard Dirac notation. It's just a vector in that space. Uh, corresponding is the characteristic vector for the vertex. And I will form these, these operators uh, through the formula, which is there. Then the Hamiltonian H root, which will be uh, an operator on that space. C2 tensored F time, F being the, the, uh, the size of the graph, uh, will be defined by this. So if you wish, it, I'm summing over all the vertices and, and the adjacency matrix will just tell me what is the interaction between the various sites. And using the notation, it will, the Hamiltonian will look like this. Now in physics, I want to know the energies. So the, the, the task is to diagonalize this operator H roof. And this can be done just by diagonalizing the adjacency matrix, the F, you see I'm working on that space. This H is on that big space, but it will suffice to diagonalize on the F by F uh, space, the F by F matrix. And so let me denote like this, my, the eigenvectors of A, omega K is the eigenvalue, L labels the degeneracy. Uh, I take those states to be orthonormalized. And so having taken the characteristic vectors also to be uh, norm, orthonormalized, this will define an orthogonal matrix that I will use to uh, introduce the creation an annihilation operator for each of the modes. I'm just doing an orthogonal transformation of the uh, creation and operators I had for each site. But in doing so, as you can imagine, it just brings this operator into this form. Namely, now I'm just, you know, counting, this is the number operator, the number of particles I have in each um, energy states. So this is how the diagonalization is achieved. Now, a word on the ground state. When dealing with fermions, there's this notion that we don't have, we, we don't want to have negative energies. So we want to have excitations to be positive. So how can we do that? Well, we fill the negative energies. We define the, the ground state to be the state where all the states with negative energies are filled. So that if you try to create one more particle, it has to be above that negative, that Fermi C, because you cannot put another fermion with the same negative energy. So this is important. So we will define this ground state by filling in the vacuum all the states, all the modes, such that the energy would be negative. Just remember that. There's a, a selection, there's a projection on the subset of eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix. Then the key object is the correlation matrix. So you, you want to know the uh, matrix 
what is the um, uh, expectation values of operators like that, of destroying a fermion at, side, uh, at vertex V prime and creating one at vertex V. There, here you'll have to believe me, because we're dealing with free fermions, any correlation, because you might want to compute expectation value for more complicated uh, operators, but they can all be computed from this two uh, point function. So this is really a fundamental object. Okay. And then it, it's easy to see that this is basically a projector now on the eigenspace omega k of a, where uh, you know these k's are such that the energies are negative. Why? Because you see, if so you pass to the, the normal modes or the energy mode, and if that mode is not in the ground state, it will be destroyed. So all, so you can only project to those modes that are present in the ground state. So main message, this is the key physical object, and that object very simply can be shown to be this projector on the eigenspace uh, omega with associated with the eigenvalues omega k that are in selected to construct the ground state. I hope you're all with me. So now how do we describe entanglement? I, so I need to split my system. So now I will select a subset of vertices that will form my subsystem one. Okay, and then there's a projector, obvious projector associated to that system. And the part two will be the complement in F of uh, this part one. And I told you that we can describe all the physics of part one by taking the reduced density matrix. So I will trace over the part two of this uh, density matrix for the system in its ground state. And then what I want to compute is the von Neumann entropy corresponding to this dense, reduced density matrix. Now, this is a, a bit more subtle, but it is known. We, this, this is a computation that this quantity can be obtained from the chopped correlation matrix. What is that? This is the restriction of the correlation matrix where the labels of the rows and the columns are restricted to those belonging to the part of the system I'm considering, part one. And so because C was this projector, a C, C roof was this projector, then if I'm restricting, I will now project with the projector on the vertices. So I have the projector on the uh, various eigen sub subspace spaces of the um, adjacency matrix sandwiched with the projectors of the on the vertices. So to sum up, uh, the main task is to diagonalize the C because yeah, I, I want to compute this, and this is a sum over eigenvalues. So I want to know the eigenvalues of C. Uh, and uh, it is expressed in terms of two projectors, one that chops the energy. So this is why I told you it's a bit important in defining the ground state, this Fermi C. So there's a restriction on the energies. And I want to define a subsystem. So I'm chopping locations. All right. And now I want to now inform with that, I want to look at the special, special situations where my fermions are on some graphs. And this is where I will go really quickly. So I want to look at graphs of associate of the association schemes. These are defined by adjacency matrices AI. They span the Bose-Messner algebra. You know the properties of the, this algebra. This is the key relation. We have the intersection numbers. Uh, and uh, well, these are symmetric uh, matrices. They are diagonalizable. Correspondingly, we have the uh, primitive idempotence. 
also properties of those. They form an alternative basis for the Bose-Messner algebra. And, uh, uh, and from, from here, you, you know, we can expand one in terms of the other. And as you know, uh, we, uh, we will have here the eigenvalue matrix uh, just from the, the properties which, which is there. Uh, these graphs are distance regular, which means that uh, because of this relation, Tanaka-san was explaining that to, to us this morning, uh, uh, the AI will be expressed, will be orthogonal polynomials in the matrix A1, which I'll just write A. And so it suffices to diagonalize A to diagonalize all the, uh, and this is the, uh, the matrix of eigenvalues. Okay, key will be the uh, Terwilliger algebra. So it extends the Bose-Messner algebra, which is uh, commutative into a no generally non-commutative algebra by introducing the dual matrices. So you pick a reference vertex. And again, you've seen it, uh, Paul explained that, uh, but you define A star via uh, A star and E star as diagonal matrices whose entries by duality those of A star are defined in terms of the, those of the idempotent EI and or EI star from those of the adjacency matrices AI. Okay, and obviously the AI star are also projectors and the Terwilliger algebra is spanned by the A's and the A star or the E and the E star. And because, um, we, we know that uh, A can be up, all the AI can be obtained from A and the same for, for the uh, A star. Uh, A and A star are the generator of the algebra. Now, why is this relevant? Well, I remind you that our key object is this, where we project on the eigenspace of uh, AI and the eigenspace well, and, and the vertices. Well, this is the job that EI does with respect to the eigenspaces of the adjacency matrix. And EI star projects on the vertices that are connected to V0 in the graph AI. So you can immediately see that this key object will lie in the Terwilliger algebra of the, uh, of the graph. Two standard examples, you know them. Uh, I will be talking about the Hamming scheme. Okay, what is there to say? I, I'll be denoting the uh, vertices of the Hamming scheme by V. So these are, and what are they? Words in K letters, words of length V in K letters. The Hamming distance, you measure where the words differ. You count where the number of uh, incidents where they differ. The uh, adjacency matrices are defined in the standard way. And as you know, uh, the recurrence relation we have is that of the Kraft-Schuck polynomials. I'll be focusing on the binary scheme just to keep things simple, Oops. Uh, which are hypercubes. As for the Johnson scheme, uh, I'll, I'll denote the vertices by the letters X and Y. They are subsets of the first and integers, uh, subsets of cardinality k. The distance is basically given by the intersection. Adjacency matrix uh, defined as for Hamming. And there, uh, the matrix eigenvalues the, uh, is uh, uh, expressed in terms of the dual Han polynomials. Okay. How am I doing? Not so good. Hello. So, I want to describe these free fermions on hypercubes. Okay, uh, let's see. So, so, uh, so I'm dealing now with strings of d of d bits, uh, and I I will use the uh, the fact that it's a Cartesian product of the complete K two graph. Adjacency matrix here is in physics notation is sigma x. And so from product in the, what I will call the computational basis, the, uh, 
matrix A will just be given by this sum over the insertion at each site of a sigma X of this matrix. As for the, as for A star, well, it's a quick, it's a very simple computation to do for K2. I'll let you do it. And you find that the A star for K2 will be sigma Z, this matrix, one minus one. And so A star, again, in this computational basis, will be given by this the insertion this time of sigma Z, of the diagonal matrix at the various site and you sum over all the possibilities. And so right from here, this is a well-known result, but you realize that the, the, the standard module of the Terwilliger algebra is homomorphic to UQ, USL2, okay? And the irreducible module or the irreducible decomposition of the standard module will be, will be equivalent to the decomposition of an irreducible representation of SU2 in the default product of SU2. And I will denote this uh, module by KJL, uh, where J identifies the irreducible representation and L its multiplicity. It's a well-known thing, at least for physicists, that you, we're using angular momentum theory to write, you all know the representation, but we like them to be unitary, so we, we put square roots. Uh, but uh, A will be two diagonal in the basis that diagonalize A star. So, and this defines this, the addition of this quantum number M, which labels the eigenvectors of A star. And in that basis, we have the action of A. Remember, we have a sigma Z uh, and sigma X occurring in the realization of these operators. Okay, I will want to discuss entanglement, so I will need to define subsystems. Uh, I'll do that in terms of neighborhood. And so we talk of the i neighborhood of V0 as a set of vertex that are distance i from V0. Uh, and so, so then I will consider subsystems, the part one, which will be made out of such neighborhood. In terms of notation, I'll, I'll take a, a subset of the uh, d, you know, of the integers going from zero to d, and I'll pick all the neighborhood associated to these integers. So this is what this SV, SV defines part one. It's the union of a number of neighborhoods. Okay, now we know that uh, A star uh, on these states, A star is diagonal with this eigenvalue, so it does not take long to realize that this will correspond to a vertex that is at distance d over 2 minus m. And moreover, that uh, each irreducible module in the decomposition of the standard module of the Terwilliger algebra will contain no more than one such vector because there's just one m in an irreducible representation. So only one such vector jm per neighborhood. And then you proceed. It's a standard thing to, to decompose H and C. They both belong to the Terwilliger algebra with this uh, default product of uh, the, the representation. And so you, you introduce the, the, you know, the operators that correspond to the irreducible subspace with its degeneracy and then labeling within the space. And you, you just uh, proceed and, and get this reduction where obviously H roof will now be given over sum of the irreducible subspace and with their degeneracy of now a, an operator restrained to the irreducible subspace. It's I don't need to go through all the steps. And similarly, you can do the same because again, this belongs to uh, the uh, Terwilliger algebra. You can bring back or reduce C or chop correlation matrix to a sum 
of uh, matrices restricted to the irreducible subspaces. Okay, now what we need to know is we remember, we want to know the, we want to diagonalize the C. This is the name of the game here. So we, but we see that we have a nice reduction through this decomposition, but we still need to obtain the entries of these uh, matrices. Well, let, let's call J omega K the eigenstate of the restriction of the um, adjacency matrix to that uh, subspace. And, uh, and then I, comp I call QMK the overlaps between the standard representation basis and the, these eigenstates. And now I know that this, uh, I know that this is diagonal on the state and two diagonal on those states. I get the three term recurrence relation. I identify it to be that of the Kraftwerk polynomial. Having done that, I recognize what the eigenvalue will be. It's of course linear in K. And, uh, and so, and then a little computation doing the same thing, just reintroducing these overlaps uh, and using the properties of the projectors, which are trivial, it just has the effect of restraining to the various domain. You see that this uh, correlation, these matrix elements are given by bilinear expression in Kraftwerk polynomial. Okay, so let's, leave that aside for a moment uh, because now that we know uh, these C's, uh, wrong move, uh, well, we can compute the entropy. We, we get a significant reduction with respect to the dimension because uh, C was the cardinality of the, the space. Now we have a further re reduction. So for instance, if our subspace consists only in one neighborhood, well, then it means that we know that we have only one M, one M in that neighborhood. So it means that this matrix is only one by one. The problem is solved. We just need to account for the degeneracy, the number of time this irreducible subspace was occurring in the decomposition. And we can proceed and it shows interesting physical features that I'll spare you for the sake of the lateness of the week. But more interesting is if we consider a part, a subsystem, which is made out of a number of neighborhoods. And so let's say that we take all the vertices that are at the distance uh, lower than uh, a certain big end. So this projector will then be the sum over from I to big N of all these, decidedly, uh, all these AI star. And it's, when you look at it, you realize that this is a bit nasty because this matrix is large, it's full, many eigenvalues are close to zero and it's a very difficult numerical problem. And this is where history and the people at Bed Lab in the 70s come to our rescue. And it's an interesting story. So let me just briefly tell it to you. It relates to a classic problem in signal processing. You have a signal uh, that is band limited. So it means that the Fourier, the, the Fourier modes only go from minus V to double, to minus W to W. And you want to ask how to, what are the signal that are best concentrated in time? The answer to that question is obtained by solving an integral equation of that form where the kernel is the sink kernel. This seems fine, but same problem. Uh, this is numerically very difficult, a full matrix with the eigenvalue, many eigenvalues close to zero. But the day was saved by the, by the fact that Slepian and company, they found it's a miracle that there's a second order differential operator that commutes with this integral operator. And this integral operator, as it turns out, can be written in that form. Projector over the time band, sandwiched between the projector between the frequency band. 
And uh, so you note the similarity with our uh, chop correlation matrix. This operator that commutes with the uh, integral operator is of this form, which is the prolate spheroidal wave function operator with a special case of the confluent Ohrn equation. And why is this a miracle? Because if D and G commute, they share the same eigenfunctions. D is a second order differential operator, easy to treat numerically. You find the eigenvector, then you, from, you act with G on these eigenvectors, you get the spectrum. Well, then so back to entanglement, the comparison, uh, you compare with fermion exchange. Well, you will recall that defining a ground state implied truncating energies. So this corresponds to band limiting. And we have this projector, PSE. Partitioning the system, defining part A, part one, and part B, amounted again to time, to, to some limit, to time limiting. And in that case, we have this projector. And the task was to diagonalize something that looks in shape very much to diagonalize G. So from this analogy, we may ask, well, can there exist an operator T with very nice properties, so uh, numerical properties, that commutes with this chop correlation matrix? And, uh, and that will share eigenvectors with C. And this operator belongs to the family that we've called generalized Hoyne operator, in part because of the connection with the spine and time limited. And uh, as you see, if I write it like this, the, the bracket is the anti-commutator. It's a bilinear in the generators of the Terwilliger algebra. And the idea is to choose the parameters mu and nu so that it will indeed commute with uh, C. And this can be done. The main reason is because T is block three diagonal in both the energy basis and the position basis, the vertex basis. And uh, you recall the action. Th this is just expressing the projection. I will not read the equation in details. And from the fact that uh, these are three diagonal, you see that T on JM, well, it will have a raising part. Well, it will increase M by one. And so at some point, you want, to, you want it to chop, okay? When it reach, when this bound is saturated. And similarly, T on in the energy basis uh, will also raise the energy by one. And at some point, you also want it to chop when you go beyond the uh, states of negative energy. And you see that, uh, well, you can enforce that. When you arrive at the bound, you, have an you will want to kill this term. And so you fix nu appropriately. And here you do so with mu. And here are the conditions that this amounts to. And if it chops, it means that it preserves the image of the projector, so it commutes with the projectors. So we, if it commutes with each projector, it will commute with the, the full chop correlation matrix, which is made out of these projectors. And because these parameters don't depend on J, as you can see, you can do it for all reducible subspaces. It holds for all K L. And then you can, from there you can work. Uh, I will not do that for you because I'd like to give you a little bit more combinatorics, uh, but you can diagonalize this T. Uh, we, we have its action here. It's, uh, it's not complicated. And then afterwards you act uh, on the eigenvectors of T with C, you find the eigenvalues and you compute C you compute the uh, entanglement entry. I'd like to close telling you the story because I think it's a bit neat about how you could you approach in the same, same way the Johnson graphs. So you, you see that the key steps were to identify the Terwilliger algebra. So I'll call this one a TJ for Johnson and then to obtain the reducible decomposition of the standard uh, module. And to do that, you embed uh, something that I think is quite well known. You embed the Johnson graph into the uh, hypercube. So X are the vertices of uh, J and K. Ket at X, the characteristic vectors. Uh, 
the uh, okay this is just the definition of a star i won't repeat the j i'll tell you when it differs so i will have j's and h for Terwilliger generators of the Terwilliger algebra of the Johnson scheme and the Terwilliger algebra of the Hamming scheme. Okay, now, now I, I want to make the correspondence uh, between these, these two algebras. And so the V's are the vertices of the uh, Hamming scheme. So I'm using again this computational basis, V is zero, one, and, and here the vectors are these up and down spins. We had observed what were the generators of the uh, Terwilliger algebra for the Hami, for the hypercube, uh, and and we let me record that the action of a star on V is given here. It is expressed in terms, of course, of the Hamming distance. Have I noted? Yes, the. Uh, analogously, the action of A star in the Johnson scheme is given here. What matters, there's some factors, don't bother too much with that, but of course it involves the, jo the Johnson distance, D. So D and partial distinguish the two uh, distances. As you probably know, we, I can embed Johnson in hypercube uh, by uh, assigning the K subsets into words which have K ones. So X will correspond to VX, where VI will be one if X belongs to the K subsets of one to M. Okay, and so uh, what will this tell you? So the, the, the vertices of J and K will be correspondence with sites and then cube that are in the K, K neighborhood, obviously, because I will have K ones of zero. This is the image uh, of the uh, projector EKH star, right? So as, I don't know if I need to do an example. Uh, so the V associated, so I'm in J31. So if I have the point, the, the, the set two, well, I, this will correspond to zero. I will put the two in the second place. Three will have the three. You can see that the distance, the Hamming distance will be two while the Johnson distance would be one. And you can convince yourself more generally that if X uh, or if VX corresponds to X, same with Y from Johnson to hypercube, the distance uh, the Johnson distance between X and Y will be half the distance between the corresponding uh, vertices in the, in the Hamming. And then you have, I'm at time. So you can translate that algebraically. You need to be uh, in the Kate neighborhood, hence the uh, Kate EK projector, and the distance should be two. So this will be the relation between AJ and AH, and the A2 is AH squared. Now, uh, for A star, now I would like to compare AJ star with AH star. These are the two formulas I had written, but you cannot quite compare because this is V0 is not V of X0. So there's a trick, you perform an anthropomorphism that exchanges V0 with V of X0, and it preserves the distance. You go through the steps, and then you're able to compare. And from the comparison, you find that AJ star is given, I had forgotten to put an H, but is roughly the action of this automorphism on the A star of the Hamming scheme. And I'm almost finished because uh, I'll try to be quick. Now, in the Hamming, we, we can write the, um, the generator A, we can split it in, just because of its form into a part of uh, you know, two to the n minus k and two to the k, where we put the, the, the sigma x insertion in that part first, and then we add them for the rest in this part. So we split it in two. Same, same with the A star, 
But because this, this I'm going a bit fast now, but you see this automorphisms involve, involve sigma x. And uh, there's a very simple properties, the, these poly matrices, the anti commute. So when you perform this, it will bring you a minus sign here. But lo and behold, what you see is that A star belongs in the tensor product of two Terwilliger algebra for the Hamming scheme. And the same is observed because given we had this expression and that E star is a polynomial in A star, uh, this remains in two copies of TH. And TH was basically SU2. So I want to cut short a little bit, but you use this connection here uh, and you observe that this expression A H square can be written in terms of J plus J minus, where you just put plus or minus, sigma plus or minus insertion by forming, you see this forms the SU2 algebra and you can use the Cactin generators. So you have sigma plus, sigma minus, you get this relation, but this is given in terms of the Casimir. And so lo and behold, uh, okay, so A is given as a projection of the Casimir of the total, the total Casimir operators. And as we saw, the, this uh, GH uh, standard module could be split into two. I can view it as a sum of uh, you know, J, the tensor product of two representation, where G1 is the first part, G2 is the second part. And you remember that we had obtained a change, a relative change of sign by conjugating with R the A of the Hamming scheme. And so the upshot of this is that AJ is basically the restriction of the Casimir operate the total Casimir operator and AJ star, the difference between J1 and J2. And this corresponds to the Klebs Gordon problem for SU2. The coefficients are given by the dual Han polynomials. And the story gets fully uh, wrapped up by observing that if I use these as generators in SU2 cross SU2, you realize what is known as the Han algebra, which characterize the uh, bispectral properties of the Han polynomial. Okay, having said all that, I hope you would, some of you could find that cute. Uh, you, you know now you fully characterize in a useful way for the problem at hand, the Terwilliger algebra of uh, J, you can obtain its irreducible decomposition because you know everything about SU2 times SU2 and you can perform the same entanglement analysis as for the Hamming graph. I'll just wrap up. Uh, so we've uh, described, so I tried to describe how to determine an entanglement entropy of free fermions on Hamming and Johnson ski. The, the key thing is this CHOP correlation matrix that we need to diagonalize. It belongs to the Terwilliger algebra, hence the irreducible decomposition of the standard T module is very relevant. The analogy with time and band limiting brought us to introduce a generalized Hoyne operator, a bilinear expression in T, which commutes with C. And I should say that there's a beautiful relation also of this with uh, integrable system theory, because we can diagonalize these Hoyne operators using the beta ansatz formalism, but that would be for another day. And uh, in all likelihood, what I've described should extend to other association schemes. So I'd like to uh, thank you all. I know it's the end of a, what has been a very full week. Thank you for uh, staying with me for, for a while, for listening. And as I'm an organizer, I'd really like to thank all the speakers, except maybe for the last one. They were all fantastic. And, uh, and let me mention that um, with some of you know, with Ada, with Paul, we're, we're organizing a uh, uh, concentration month in as part of a you know full semester program in uh, called Symmetries, Algebras and Physics at the, at the CRM. 
And uh, I put hope in big letters. We really hope to see you all in Montreal. It would be roughly at the same time next year. Stay healthy and uh, enjoy your weekend. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Luke. Let's uh, give a round of applause for Luke and all the other speakers of this conference. And are there any questions for Luke? I see that there is one in the in the chat. Shall yeah, I? Yeah. Shall... Oh. yeah, go ahead, Bill. Please. So, uh, so, so thank you very much, Luke. It, Luke, it was it was a great uh, way to cap off the week to to uh, include the algebraic graph theory to the physics in, in, in the, the full spectrum of the week in one talk. It was very nice. I think I understood uh, parts of it, uh, except J31, I got lost. But um, I, you know, <laughs> I, I, um, I, I was um, really curious about this, um, this analog of the differential operator. So you know, there are various things in the graph theory literature about something uh, differentiating on, on, on a Hamming scheme or other association schemes. Um, is there is there some way in which this analog behaves like a differential operator combinatorially? Oh, I, I really have not no I don't know. It's just a big uh, big messy matrix. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I really don't know. But it, it's uh, it, I I find it quite remarkable that uh, it's this history of uh, maybe uh, 40, 50 years ago is now brought to. Uh, to, to bear on very current uh, problems. And, and the role that the, the algebra of Paul, the Terwilliger algebra is playing, it's, it's quite beautiful, in fact. But well, I don't can... know, I, I'd be very curious to, because uh, I'm quite intrigued and it's not the end. Uh, it, it, it all, it relates also deeply to the study of bispectral problems and uh, integrable models. It, so it ties many very nice mathematical and topics and physical questions together in a beautiful way. I have no idea how you found that Slepian uh, paper. But that, that's, that's a great connection. Thank you. And uh, let me, just as one of the participants, I want to thank all the organizers, Luke included. Um, as participants, we had a great week and there were so many wonderful talks. So if, if we were in a room, I'd stand up in front of the room and embarrass you. But uh, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Bill. Uh, can I ask a question? But it's a naive question. Um, so, um, are the Johnson schemes and Hamming schemes special? Like, are they more favorable? Or because you also mentioned that you can look at other association schemes. Um, well, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong. And I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not so knowledgeable. But Paul mentioned, you know, the 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 composition, the reducible decomposition of the Terwilliger standard module, is not. A, a problem that is so widely uh, solved, as far as I know. And uh, so that was the great advantage of these two schemes, their connection to SU2 representations, because we could carry the, uh, the decomposition. Um, I can tell you that we're now looking at the, the uh, Q scheme, dual polar and grass, grassland scheme. Uh, it, it's we're, we're, we are about ready to, to put the pen to paper, but uh, it was not uh, obvious again to, to do that. And so that, that is one. So it, it, it has brought, I think, interesting question for uh, algebraic graph theory also. Paul, uh, Paul do you care to, to comment on, on that? I, I might be talking nonsense, but... Uh, You're muted, Paul. If, if, if you're speaking, Paul, we can't hear you because you're muted. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, for the um, for the Johnson and Gre and Hamming graphs, uh, as you're indicating, it's very clear what is the decomposition of the standard module into irreducible T modules. Uh, but if you take a generic uh, Q polynomial, even Q polynomial distance regular graph. Um, it is not obvious and has not been worked out in general what, what is the decomposition into irreducible T-modules. Uh, it is a little, it's always been a little mysterious to me why 
that problem is so difficult. Um, it doesn't, one, one likes to um, uh, uh, you know, solve, solve the problem, any given problem, uh, you know, using only the intersection numbers of the, of the given graph, but somehow there isn't quite enough information uh, if you know for a generic uh, Q polynomial distance regular graph, not quite enough information coming from the uh, intersection numbers uh, to enable you to completely decompose the standard module into irreducible T modules. It also made me wonder: Are we? Are we, is there something missing? Some some ingredient, just a little something that we're missing. Um, that um, if we knew what it was, would enable us to completely decompose that standard module. <laughs> <laughs> One so, point. Bill, the, the other scheme that we, we did do this for with Luke is the Hadamard, the Hadamard graphs, because there the first T module is actually the whole Terwilliger algebra, which we use implicitly, but not explicitly. But Luke was using the fact that you can embed the Johnson graph in the Hamming graph, in the, in the binary Hamming graph now, but the wheels fall off that very quickly. Um, if you just try and go to place the binary Hamming graph by H and Q, um, then and try and get the Grassmann graphs out, what you discover is that the, the thing that you're embedded in is no longer just a regular graph. So there's an algebra there, but it's not it's no longer just a regular graph. Yeah, you're no, looking no, at the uh, subspace sub slabs of you know, subspaces of a Next yes. place at the GFQ. Well, let, and it's interesting and you can work with it, but it's not giving you a distant regular graph. Yes. So we're about to put, I, I need to put the final touches. We succeeded again with uh, Pierre Antoine Bernard and uh, Nicolas Crampé uh, for finding that the that decomposition for the uh, dual polar graph by going through the, the subgraph so uh, as an intermediate yeah. step. And uh, indeed, it's not distance regular. That's also a question if we could do a um, study of entanglement on graphs that are not distance regular. It seems to suggest that this would, could be possible. But, uh, but Paul, we, I hope you hope we'll, we'll all enjoy that. But we, we have obtained it now for the uh, dual polar. We have obtained the decomposite, the, Irreducible decomposition for the dual polar graph going through that path. And uh, it, it connects to, of course, UQSL2. Is it important to you that the scheme is P polynomial or Q polynomial, or is it just that those are the ones for which this algebra has been worked out? Uh, well, this is what we're starting to put in question. It, it's just because it, it's the, more, the most natural to study. We started with Hamming uh, for obvious reasons. But uh, well, uh, I don't know. We'll we'll we'll, we'll look at we'll look at that. These uh, so many many of these distance regular graphs um, are uh, so Im embedded in this, um, a poset uh, a very 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 special sort a so called uniform poset. Um, so the dual polar graphs, for example, um, are sitting at the, on the top fiber of a certain uh, uh, poset. The elements of the poset are, consist of all the subspaces of some fixed uh, finite dimensional vector space over a finite field that are iso totally isotropic with respect to a given bilinear form. Okay, anyway, so a certain uh, pose, so pose that uh, defined by inclusion, uh, where the, uh, the vertices of the dual polar graph are the, um, the maximal isotropic subspaces. So they're sitting at the top rank of this pose set. Anyway, the pose set has this uniform property. Um, I, I wrote a paper about abstract uniform pose sets uh, back in the early 90s, um, and I defined a sort of analog of the subconstituent algebra, called it the incidence algebra. And for all these uh, posts, the uniform post sets, um, the, um, 
it is possible to decompose the standard module into a direct sum of irreducible uh, T modules, or you know, the, the T being the ice, the uh, uh, the incidence algebra in this case. Um, recently, I've realized that the essential reason why the structure of the uh, these uh, uniform post sets worked out so nicely is that al although they are not distance regular graphs, um, they they are distance regular with respect to the zero of the post set, so to speak. If you think of the the post set as being represented by the Hassan diagram, that think of that as an undirected graph, um, and um, it's distance regular not in general, but it is with respect to one of the vertices. The, so think of it as the base vertex, you know, from the point of view of the subconstituent algebra. And more than that, um, the, these graphs are Q polynomial with respect to that base vertex. Um, with, as long as you interpret things um, appropriately, uh, you have to replace the adjacency matrix by a weighted adjacency matrix where your weights depend on the rank, what rank you're looking at inside the post set, so to speak. But anyway, uh, it's possible to generalize the, the, the standard theory of association schemes or distance regular graphs by allowing these weighted adjacency matrices and, and only um, uh, can consider, you know, no longer requiring um, distance regularity, but just distance regularity with respect to one vertex. Um, so it's possible to generalize the, sub, the, the, uh, the standard theory in order to handle these uniform pose sets and the, and the graphs that we're now discussing. Thank you very much, Paul, for these uh, thoughtful uh, comments. Uh, we'll, we'll try to see how the uh, they must relate to what we are currently uh, looking at. All right. Yeah. I, I, so, so perhaps we could carry on uh, uh, after we send off the conference since uh, Luke uh, maybe has to go, but we can continue on the discussion after some closing remarks. Yes, uh, so uh, it, it looks rude. The fact is I have a, a, a meeting which has started the uh, and so I, I four minutes ago. <laughs> four minutes ago, I, I thought. Sorry, you're Luke. Very, you're very, you're very, well. I was late. It's my fault. And you're very kind to comment on, on the on the talk. I I again my uh, warmest talk uh, thanks to all of you for you know, taking part in in this meeting. And we, we need a, you know all the organizers contributed, but Ada again, our hat to you. Thank you so much. Be all well. And apologies for uh, pulling pulling away. So look forward to seeing you all soon, and hopefully in person. So long. Thank you, Luke. Let's thank Luke and all of the speakers again for great talks. All the speakers. And also, uh, uh, I'd like to thank.